Good afternoon, everybody. Before I introduce today's speaker, can I request you all to turn your mobile phones onto silent mode? Thank you. Well, uh, I'm very happy today to have to welcome Professor Gadkar to PRL and Mrs. Gadkar. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here on this very short notice. Um, in fact, gave a talk at uh, Gujarat University this morning on how to do science with a shoestring budget, and um, I'm told it was an excellent talk. Well, uh, Professor Gadakar is currently the DST Year of Science Chair Professor at the Center for Ecological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He obtained his B.Sc. Honours and M.Sc. in Zoology from Bangalore University and a Ph.D. in Molecular Biology from IISC. And during the past three and a half decades or so, he has established a very active school of thought in the area of animal behaviour, ecology and evolution. The origin and evolution of cooperation in animals, particularly in social insects like ants and bees and wasps, is a major goal of his research. But what he has done is utilized crucial elements in India's biodiversity, and by doing so, he has added a special Indian flavor to his research. Professor Gadakar was the president of the Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, and chairman, Center for Contemporary, Sci Contemporary Sciences, IASC Bangalore. He's an honorary professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research and uh, also a non-resident permanent fellow of the Wissenschaft College in Berlin. He has published over 250 research papers and articles, plus two books. His research work has been recognized by a number of awards, including the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, the B.M. Birla Science Prize, the Homi Baba Fellowship, the B.P. Pal National Environmental Fellowship on Biodiversity, the Third World Academy of Sciences Award in Biology, and the H.K. Firodia Award. He also has been awarded the Cross of Order of Merit from the Federal Republic of Germany. He is an elected fellow of all the three Indian academies, and also an elected fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences. He is a foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences USA and the German National Science Academy in Leopoldina. He is on the editorial boards of several national and international scientific journals, including the Board of Reviewing Editors of Science and Scientific Advisory Committee to the Cabinet Government of India. So with these words, I would now like to invite Professor Gadakkar to deliver his lecture on why and how I do my research, some reflections on the pursuit and evaluation of science. Professor Gadakkar. Good afternoon. Can you hear me at the back there? I am delighted to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ashok Singhvi for inviting me to give this talk, and I'd like to thank the Director PRL for his hospitality, both here and at Mount Abu, which we are looking forward to, uh, my wife and I, tomorrow, to see your observatory, but also to enjoy Mount Abu. I'm very happy to be here to give this talk. I want to begin by saying I work on insects, I work on insect societies. I'm interested in how they cooperate and how they balance cooperation and conflict. But I believe that one of the problems with science is that scientists only communicate the products of their research outside their own uh, expertise. They do not discuss the process of science. In my opinion, the process of science is more important. It's more important to communicate the process of making a discovery rather than just the discovery that you have made. If you only tell people what you have discovered, it sounds like magic, and it sounds like only you could have made it, and everybody has to just accept what you have said. But if you lay bare the process by which science happens, then people are able to understand you, they're able to evaluate you, they're able to disagree with you, or if they agree with you, they know why they are agreeing with you. And therefore, whenever I give talks, I try to convey, give equal importance to the process by which we found whatever we found, 
as much as to say what we have found. Now, I would argue that the products of your research are of interest to a narrow group of people. But the process is of interest to a much wider group of people because the processes apply across disciplines. And one proof of that is that if I was only going to talk the, about the products of my research, I would not have been invited to PRL to give a talk. But since I'm willing to talk about the process, I can talk to a wider audience. So what I'm going to do today is in fact talk to you more or less only about the process, but reflect more broadly, not just about my research, but in general. And that's why you see the main title I have given is how and why I do my research. But the subtitle is some reflections on the pursuit and evaluation of science. I'm delighted to see a large number of young people in the audience because I suspect that most of what I'm going to say is already very familiar to the senior scientists here. I'll be preaching only to the choir, but I really want to catch the attention of young people and try to persuade them uh, to my point of view. Uh, I will try. I mean, you don't have to agree, but I'm hoping that I will persuade some of you to my point of view about how science should be done and how science should be evaluated. My message I'll outline my message in, in the beginning. There are many valid ways and many valid reasons for doing science. We should not fetishize one way or one reason. Different people have different ways of doing science and different reasons for science. And I have nothing against that. I am not trying to make science monolithic. It is very much diverse and it should be so. Which particular way you do science or which particular reason for, by, for which you do science, I believe is not important because all of them are okay. What is important is that you constantly think about how and why you do research. Each of us should constantly think about how and why I do my research. It doesn't matter that it is different or similar to somebody else, but I should think about this constantly. And therefore, I believe the journey is more important than the destination. The destination is not the only thing, it's the journey that is very important. And so I think based on that, I will try and elaborate how and why I do my research. In this lecture, I will explore some of the following topics. How to make the transition, and here I'm especially addressing students, how to make the transition from taking courses and passing exams to doing research and making discoveries. We make students very good at pass, taking courses, passing exams, and suddenly from tomorrow we ask them to do research. And the students think that the same strategies which made them successful will help them in this research. Unfortunately, this is not always true, and you have to make a transition. And I will spend a few minutes talking about that. The second topic I want to talk about is how to choose an appropriate research topic. This is given the least importance, especially in India. Students are often told by their supervisors what to do. And I think with that, the students don't get an opportunity to think about it. I would argue that even if you are told what to do and you are doing what you have been told, you can still think and try to understand why you have been told to do that particular thing. So choosing a research topic is very important. We give very little importance to that. In fact, I, I have seen no discussion about how to choose a research topic. The third thing I want to talk about is finding and applying appropriate research methodologies. Here again, most of the time we go by what is available, what other people have used, and what somebody has told you, but we do not think deeply about what methodologies to use, especially if there are multiple methodologies possible. How and where to publish research findings? This, of course, is a very controversial topic, a very difficult topic, and I want to spend a few minutes on that. And finally, uh, this is addressed to the senior scientists here, but all the junior scientists sitting here tomorrow, very soon, you will be sitting on the other side of the table and you will be judging and evaluating the work of other people. And we have no culture worldwide, we have no culture of training people how to judge and how to evaluate. 
we believe that we are born judges and born evaluators and by the time you do some research you have become very good at judging and evaluating others unfortunately we have not so we need discussion of this so you see these are the kinds of issues which we need to discuss which are seldom discussed and so this entire lecture will be devoted to this but the way i will do this is i do not claim that i have so much wisdom that i can just tell you one by one all of these things certainly not in fact there is no one answer to any of these questions there is no single way of doing any of these things so there is no way i can tell you all of these things all i will do is i will describe my thoughts on some of these matters and will hope to inspire the audience to reflect on them and come up with their own thoughts all i can do is to inspire you to think of these five different topics i am not going to give you the answers to this but i want to inspire you to think about it because each of us has to think about this so let me begin with the first topic how to make the transition from taking courses and passing exams to doing research and making discoveries as i said it is often thought that there is a simple continuum that the same strategy will work unfortunately the same strategy will not work often you need a completely opposite strategy so in my experience in order to do this the first thing you have to do is really turn around 180 degrees you have to completely change your strategy let me give you an illustration of this the best way to pass an exam is to read up what interests you what you are good at and attempt those questions where you are very good at so if you have a set of questions and you have a choice of 6 out of 8 or 4 out of 8 of them it makes complete sense to say i am going to attempt those four questions or those four topics or i am going to write my dissertation on those topics where i am very comfortable i am familiar i am competent makes perfect sense place yourself in that region where you are comfortable and competent now this is a terrible strategy for doing research because if you are going to remain in your zone of competence then you are not going to make any new discoveries in fact what you need to do is you have to move away from the comfort zone of knowledge and familiarity you have to move away from that and you have to position yourself in the discomfort zone of ignorance and unfamiliarity every day you will come across things that you do not know you do not know how to do you do not know how to answer if you are in that zone then chances are that you will make some new discovery if you are in a comfort zone which is perfectly all right for passing exams it's not a great strategy for doing research to put it in very short terms in very colloquially you must learn to enjoy feeling stupid if you are a good researcher you are all the time feeling stupid if you are feeling smart you are not making discoveries you are only repeating what somebody else has said you must enjoy feeling stupid you must say i don't know i don't know how this works you must always be feeling that you are stupid you don't know how it is if you are only in the zone where you don't know you will find something new if you are in the zone where you know you will simply repeat what somebody else has said i will continue stop taking pleasure in efficiently storing and recalling information this is the bedrock of passing exams read remember recall and regurgitate this is how exams are usually designed and the better you are at that the better you will be in your exam scores this is completely useless for research in fact i would say stop being ashamed of your inability to recall facts you can always find the facts you need you don't have to store everything in your head and recall them all the time in fact the worst way to prepare for research is to become a successful uh, person in a quiz you uh, look at these quizzes and you are supposed to remember everything what was the color of the sari of jay badur in that movie they ask you and if you answer it you get a score such things are totally useless for research so stop being ashamed of your inability and the converse of that is be delighted that you don't already know the answer and thus have an opportunity to think de novo in fact when i teach my students it is becoming harder and harder to teach students because information is now so easily available all my students know more than me they go to the internet and they sit up all night and they know everything 
But this knowledge is not useful because they know the final product. They don't know how somebody came to know that. They know the facts. And the moment you know something, there is a feeling that you know it completely. You don't. In fact, I try very hard to choose a topic to teach where my students don't know the facts. So that I can make them derive the facts de novo. Start with common sense and try and logically reason out what that fact may be. Not memorize ready-made facts given to you by others. On the one hand, internet is extremely useful because you can go and find what you want. But it is harmful if you simply as a hobby keep surfing the internet and transferring bytes and kilobytes and megabytes of information from the cyberspace into your head. That's not useful. In fact, I tell my students, let the facts be in the internet. You go and find it only when you want. The rest of the time, keep space in your brain to think. Because thinking is what you need to do, not simply storing facts. When I do this, my students sometimes ask, then what is the role of intelligence in doing this? Do you have to be very intelligent to be a scientist? This is not easy to answer. This is a very difficult question. But it's a question that many people have grappled with. What is the role of intrinsic intelligence in doing research? I was very impressed with the answer given by a very famous scientist, Nobel laureate, Sir Peter Medawar, who, as some of you may know, was the father of immunology. But apart from making very, very important contributions to the subject of immunology, he was very famous because he wrote extensively. He wrote for scientists, he wrote for students, he wrote for laymen. And he was a brilliant writer, in addition to being a brilliant scientist. And he used to constantly write articles, many of which have been put together in form of books. There's a wonderful book called Advice to a Young Scientist, which I recommend all young scientists read. In that, there is one, at one place, he takes up the question of intelligence. And let me quote what Peter Medawar says. Peter Medawar says that he usually has an intelligence test for scientists. And he says, if, scientists pa if people pass this intelligence test, then I say you are good for research. What is his intelligence test? He says, to many I, some of the figures of the great painter El Greco, El Greco's paintings, seem to be unnaturally tall and thin. So here is an example. El Greco's paintings, the, he figures, seem to be unnaturally tall and thin. This is a fact. This is gi given. This is known. Now, an ophthalmologist surmised that they were drawn so because El Greco suffered a defect of vision that made him see people that way. And as he saw them, so he would necessarily draw them. This is the hypothesis of the ophthalmologist. And Peter Medawar goes on to say, can such an, ask, can such an interpretation be valid? And then he goes on to say that his verdict, anyone who can see instantly that this explanation is nonsense and is nonsense for philosophic rather than aesthetic reasons is undoubtedly bright. On the other hand, Anyone who still can't see it as nonsense, even when, it is, when its nonsensicality is explained, must be rather dull. The explanation is epistemological. That is, it has to do with the theory of knowledge, not about aesthetics. Now, this is very interesting, but I slightly differ from Peter Medawar, and I have a slightly different verdict. This is not quite my verdict. My verdict is as follows, using the same example. To me, it matters less whether and how soon you see its nonsensicality. Anyone who feels too lazy to think through this apparent conundrum and gives up before pronouncing a judgment, right or wrong, should probably not opt for a career in science. Mental laziness is incompatible with good science. We have to overcome mental laziness if we want to good science, but I can assure you that it's not easy. It needs practice. Different people have different ways of practicing. 
but you should find your own way and practice not to become mental lazy, mentally lazy and not to give up before you reach the end in your thought process. It's very easy to give up because nobody is watching. Nobody knows when you stop. You start thinking of a problem and you feel lazy, you stop. There is no punishment because nobody knows. If you're doing something physically and you stop, people know and there may be some embarrassment. Mental thing is done in private and at least till today we don't have the technology where people know what you're thinking. That may change soon, but today we don't have. And so it's very convenient just to stop thinking. And that is what you need to practice. Now I move on to choosing an appropriate research topic. Again, I will tell you about myself. You have to think it for yourself. Making a significant new discovery is extremely difficult. Most people who enter school pass successive exams, you en enroll in a bachelor's degree, you get a bachelor's degree, master's degree, you get a PhD. That's all easy. But making a significant new discovery is extremely difficult and we must accept that. One in a thousand or one in a million of us will actually make a significant discovery. It is not straightforward. It is not deterministic. If I work so hard 14 hours a day, if I have all this is a equipment and these instruments and I work for so many years, then I will make a significant discovery. This is not true at all. It is extremely difficult. And in order to enhance the probability that you will make a significant discovery, you have to do a few things which are actually counter, counterintuitive, opposite of what we normally do. First is we have to avoid crowds and fashions. The most common way by which people choose a research topic is that this is fashionable, this is important, everybody is doing this. That's the way people choose the topic. But if you want to make a significant discovery, then you have to do exactly the opposite. I tell my students, if you want to be a scientist, a real scientist, find a topic which is not fashionable today and make it fashionable tomorrow then you get success. If you work on a topic which is already fashionable, you are plastering the wall of which has already been built. So just the opposite of what we normally do. Don't read too much. Very counterintuitive, especially in your field. In the old days, people used to say, first six months of your PhD, go to the library and read everything that has been published on your subject. Then you come back and you tighten a few screws is all you will do. I tell my students, do not read too much in your field. Because if you know facts, your mind refuses to think. That doesn't mean don't read. I tell my students, you should read much more than others, but not in your field. Read voraciously, especially when something appears irrelevant. The only way to see, see the successful scientist is one who has seen what others have failed to see. What is the chance that you will see what others have failed to see? You should look from a different angle. Because from the angle that everybody is looking, probably somebody has already seen it. If you look from some other angle, then you may see something that others have not seen. And the only way to see from other angle is to know other facts which others don't know. Because everybody knows the facts that lead you to this, in, this end. You have to come from somewhere else. You have to have a different perspective. And the way to have different perspective is to re read less on this subject, but read a great deal outside, around it, often something completely irrelevant. And then you will be able to see something which others have not seen. In my own personal case, in addition to trying to do all of this, I also do something which I would have thought is not at all counterintuitive, but it turns out that it is very rare. I capitalize on my advantages and avoid my disadvantages. By no means this sounds counterintuitive. It seems obvious that everybody should do this. But I find that most people don't do that. And I find it very surprising that people don't do that. So here, all, the best I can do is to actually give you my specific example of research. I already told you that I work on cooperation and conflict in insect societies. And I will tell you why and how I do this. So this area of work, in biology, we study living organisms. We study living organisms at all scales, from molecules all the way to the biosphere. So we have molecules, we have atoms, we have molecules, we have cells, we have tissues, we have organs, we have individuals, we have populations, we have communities, we have ecosystems, and then we have the whole biosphere. We study all of these things. 
Now, there is a nice division of this hierarchy of scales of the organization of life somewhere breaking in the middle. The individual organism, the human being or the tiger or the cat or the dog or the bee, that individual is somewhere in the middle of this hierarchical organization. Above the individual you have families, populations, communities, ecosystems, biosphere. Below that you have organs, tissues, cells, organelles, genes, molecules. This is a kind of nice intermediate. And it's very interesting for completely different reasons. The way you study biological or living or hierarchy of organization at the individual and above is very different from the way you would study at the lower level. The main reason for this seems to be simply the visual scale. The individual and the population and the community and so on are easily visible to you and are easily observable without too much augmentation. Let me elaborate on that. So, okay, without too much augmentation and therefore you do that. Now, what are the strengths and weaknesses that I would have if I choose to do research in India? My strengths are that there is a rich biodiversity. I have access to unusual flora and fauna. Many of my colleagues in Northern Hemisphere, in Europe, in America, they don't have access to this. And I have access to this. So this is my strength. And I should capitalize on this strength. Instead, I find that many of my colleagues work on a small piece of DNA that they have brought back from Rockefeller University or somewhere else in their postdoc. And my American friends come to India and say, I want to go to Western Ghats. You have so many frogs there, I want to study them. So this is something very strange that I don't understand. We have access to large manpower. In fact, when I tell my American uh, colleagues that I have six PhD students, they say, my God, you must have really have a huge research grant. I said, I don't have any research grant. My institute pays for my six PhD students, and they cannot believe it. They have to write grants, get huge sums of money to pay each graduate student, each technician, each lab assistant, even each undergraduate student. For manpower for them is the most expensive thing. But it's not so for us. And we have people. They don't have people. So we have manpower and we do not utilize that. What are our weaknesses? By and large, we have modest research budgets compared to people in NIH and uh, Caltech and various places. By and large, on average, we have modest research budgets and we have relatively poor access to sophisticated equipment and technology. I think we should accept these weaknesses and we should recognize these strengths. And therefore, I attempt to substitute technology with brain power because I have a head start in terms of brain power because of all the students I can get and I have relative difficulty in getting the latest technology. I can get but it won't really be the latest. In recent times in biology, the use of molecular methods have revolutionize the study of ecology, evolutionary biology and even taxonomy. So even this level above the individual has been revolutionized by the use of molecular techniques. Nobody can deny that this is a welcome development, but we must ask ourselves whether we are making our research more expensive than necessary. And I am convinced that many of us are making our research more expensive than necessary because there is social prestige in doing expensive research. There is social academic prestige in having large research grants. Whether we are neglecting old questions which need old methods because it is fashionable to say I am using next generation sequencing. I am using yesterday's sequencing doesn't sound very nice. But there are many problems that you can solve using yesterday's sequencing. Those problems are thrown by the wayside because we all want to do the latest. Whether we are selecting against people who do not use modern methods. Are we selecting scientists as good simply because they use modern methods rather than what they are actually discovering. Whether we are losing the traditional advantages that we enjoyed, namely the manpower and the access to biodiversity. These are questions one must think of. I suspect there are similar parallel questions one can think of in physics and chemistry and mathematics and engineering and technology. I am not uh, familiar with those fields, but my 
my goal here is to inspire you to think along these lines translate this to into your own field i am sure whether it is technology or engineering or chemistry or physics or even mathematics there are similar phenomena happening and there are ways of trying to capitalize on our advantages and avoid our weaknesses again personal statement i don't choose a topic just because it is to f- easy to find funding for it or because it would be easier to publish in a high profile journal i find that people now people are emboldened enough to explicitly say that i'm going to work on this topic because funding is available on this topic in the previously they used to do it with a little embarrassment now they say it publicly i'm doing this because there is funding on this or i'm doing this because i have met people who say what do you what kind of research do you want to do i want to do something that will get published in nature so this has now become almost socially acceptable and i think there is a great danger in going that direction i repeatedly justify my research from first principles this i think is extremely important no matter what you do no matter why you have chosen a particular topic no matter whether you have done it of your own free will or you did it because of certain constraints we have to constantly justify to ourselves and ask why am i doing this this is a practice that we must keep doing all the time and again i cannot tell you why you are doing your research i can only tell you why i am doing my research i can only show you how i try to do this repeatedly so i was talking about these hierarchical levels of organization so above the individual that sub branch of biology is called organismal biology and the one below that is called sub organismal biology or often called cellular and molecular biology the technical details are not important for you because you have to now translate this to your discipline i'm telling you what is in my discipline and i am an organismal biologist not a sub organismal biologist although my phd was in molecular biology and i must every day i must tell myself why did i do this why did i move away from sub organismal biology to organismal biology i have to keep reinforcing why i made this decision in my case again you have to do this for your own field why am i an organismal biologist as i already said we can broadly classify biology into organismal and sub organismal biology but the consequence of that is that once dichotomous is in this way we find a major practical difference in pursuing sub organismal and organismal biology practicing cell and molecular biology almost always requires significant technological augmentation of our sensory capabilities we need to f- we need fine chemicals and instruments to isolate and the components which we wish to study centrifuge them use chromatographs and the like to uh, separate them and microscopes and spectroscopes and the like to visualize them we can't do this with our naked eyes ears and noses this invariably makes the pursuance of sub organismal biology a technology intensive and a financially expensive proposition on the other hand organismal biology deals with structures and phenomena that are in the perception range of our own sensory capabilities there is a great deal that we can do without special isolation separation and visualization and without the need for sophisticated technology and large research grants there are two more features of organismal biology it is facilitated by access to rich biodiversity and is very labor intensive now you can see therefore that the things that organismal biology is independent of technology fine chemicals money and those that it is dependent upon biodiversity management uh, manpower etc together make it just the right choice for someone like me in a developing country in my attempt to work in the cutting edge of international knowledge if i want to work at the cutting edge then i must use do where i am strong and if you now contrast organismal sub organismal biology the clear winner for me would be organismal biology and not sub organismal biology as i said those of you who work in other disciplines must find parallel things this is for me a necessary and sufficient explanation for why i am an organismal biologist and i repeatedly tell myself this because i especially moved from the fashionable more socially prestigious sub organismal biology to the old fashioned classical less prestigious organismal biology even if you are moved in the opposite direction you must justify 
it's all right. You may say, okay, I have actually chosen to move from organism to suborganism biology. But you must ask yourself why. You must at least convince yourself. There is nothing like convincing yourself. That is the hardest thing to do. It's easy to convince others. But if something is not true, you don't believe in something, it's much harder to convince yourself. So you must convince yourself that you are doing the right thing. Now, within suborganism biology, I will go further and try and justify for myself why am I doing the exact thing that I'm doing? Now, in suborganism, you can study many things. Now, I study evolution. Why do I study evolution? Why not ecology? Why not biogeography? Why not phylogeography? Why not something else? I study evolution. And I must tell myself, I must convince myself, why am I doing this? Constantly, I must do that. And my way of convincing myself why I have chosen evolution rather than everything else is based on a famous statement by, made by a very famous evolutionary biologist called Dobzhansky and he said nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. If you don't have evolution, if you don't think in evolutionary terms, nothing makes sense to you. Everything seems unconnected. In fact, there is another statement made by another famous evolutionary biologist who said in biology the alternative to thinking in evolutionary terms is not to think at all. So, it seems obvious to me that my first choice within organism biology is evolution. So, I told you why I chose organism biology and why I chose evolution. Now, within evolution, of course, there are many things. So, evolution and ecology are related in that area. There are many different things to do. So, let us think of ecology and evolution. And you have here living organisms and ecology is the interaction of living organisms with their environment. Now, the environment can be classified into a non-living component of the environment and a living component of the environment. And you could either study this or you could study this. Now, in terms of the non-living environment component, you find that there is some feedback, but there is no arms race. If I interact with the inanimate component of the environment, it does not usually fight back. But with the living environment, there is a constant arms race. I become faster at catching a prey, the prey becomes faster at running away from me. So there is a feedback loop, there is an arm race. So I find this much more complex and much more interesting and there I have made a conscious choice not to go to this box but to come to this box. But once you come to this box, again there is a subdivision. If you take a living organism and look at its interaction with the living component of the environment, that living component can be classified into two kinds. I interact with other members of my own species and I interact with other members of other species. So this is other species, same species. Now in the other case of other species, I, you can you observe that individuals can be selfish or they can cooperate. Either I can be selfish or I can cooperate with another species. When it comes same species, in addition to selfishness and cooperation, you also find that individuals can be altruistic. You will never find altruism shown by one species toward another species. This is non-existent. In fact, you can go beyond that and you can even find observed spite. And you will never find this with other species. So this kind of interaction is much richer. And therefore, I have consciously chosen to move away from this uh, domain to this domain. This is my conscious explanation to myself as to what I am doing. And I keep saying repeatedly that this is not, may not be relevant to most of you, but you must find parallels in your own domain. In fact, just to reiterate this point, I want to quote Darwin who said, if it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my whole theory. And that is the sort of proof I am giving you for this. Now, we can divide further. Now, you take a living organism. So, this is why I use same species rather than other species. Now, let us look at these interactions that are happening and let us try and tabulate these interactions. So, let us consider a situation where you have one individual which is the actor and another individual which is the recipient. Both belong to the same species. When actors and recipients interact with each other, two kinds of things happen. The actor can help the recipient, I denote that by a positive symbol, or it can harm the recipient, I denote that by a negative symbol. 
Similarly, the recipient can benefit or harm this. When they help each other, we use the word cooperation. When the actor makes the life of the recipient difficult, then we call that an act of selfishness. When both of them benefit, plus and plus, then we, when, when, is, when we call it cooperation. Now, if the actor benefits, suffers and the recipient benefits, then we call it altruism. If both suffer, we call it spite. So now I have four choices before me. I can study cooperation, I can study selfishness, I can study altruism, or I can study spite. How do I choose? There has to be a logical way of choosing at every step. In the case of cooperation, it is very common. So actually, it's very easy to study. But it is too easy to explain. Darwin has already explained it. So there's not much for me to do. What about selfishness? It is common and again, it is easy to explain. It's the other side of Darwin's theory. Altruism is common, relatively common, but extremely difficult to explain. In fact, the evolutionary origin of altruism remains one of the major unsolved problems in evolutionary biology till today. So it is common but difficult to explain. Spite on the other hand is rare and difficult to explain. So now you see the reason from this, it is obvious to me that this is what I should be studying. It's common but it is difficult to explain. I don't want common and easy to explain. I don't want rare and difficult to explain because I can always say it's so rare that I have hardly been able to study it. I have a ready-made excuse to fail. So clearly for me, logically, this is where I should be. And that's what I've been doing. And I study altruism in social insects. Why does a honeybee commit suicide when it stings you to defend its colony? Why do ant workers spend their whole lives rearing the offspring of the queen and they themselves die without ever producing any offspring? Those are the questions I'm interested in. Now, in answering those questions, there are two ways of doing it. There are two ways of answering any question in evolutionary biology. And these questions are sometimes called why questions and how questions. For example, I'll give you, take a different example, which is more familiar for you. Birds sing during the mating season. Male birds sing, all of you know that. Why do they sing? You can ask why do they sing? You can ask how do they sing? If you want to know how do they sing, you have to understand the anatomy and the physiology of song production. If you want to know why they sing, you must ask why they sing, what happens if they don't sing? What is the cost for them if they don't sing? So you can have how questions and why questions. And in relation to my own field of altruism, I can ask why questions, namely, why are ants, bees and wasps social in the first place? Why are they not going off on their own? Why are they living in a group? What are the evolutionary advantages of social life over solitary life? Mosquitoes and cockroaches and most beetles and bugs are solitary. But ants, bees, wasps and termites are social. Why? But I can also ask how? How are they social? What are the mechanisms of social organization, communication, division of labor? In a honeybee colony, there is a single queen, many, many workers. Each one knows what kind of work to do. They know what food is required. They go out and bring the right food. They know where the food is available. They are able to find their home back when they come back. None of these things are required for a solitary animal. So I can ask how questions and why questions. And one option is I see which one is better for me and I choose that. In this case, I come to a different conclusion. The history of our field has shown that an answer to a why question is never complete without a corresponding answer to several how questions. And an answer to a how question is never complete without corresponding answer to related why questions. And here, therefore, the logical solution for me is to do both. So you, you must go where logic takes you. Here logic tells me that I should do both. And for the last 30, 40 years, I and my students have been parallelly pursuing these kinds of why questions and these kinds of how questions using a very interesting Indian social wasp, paper wasp called Ropalidia marginata. This is 
very abundantly available and we study this for nearly 40 years I and my students have been studying this and trying to understand when do they cooperate, how do they cooperate, when do they build the nest, how do they build the nest, when do they fight, how do they fight, when do they uh, bite another individual, why do they bite another individual. These are the kind of things we have been doing. And why do we do this? Because we hope that we can understand these societies. But the question arises, can we really understand in insect society? We are human beings. Can we claim that we know why a wasp is doing what it is doing? Now, we do not take this question lightly. We do not say, the person who is asking this question is very stupid. It is of course possible as a scientist to know what it is. We do not. We very take this question very seriously. In fact, you can broaden the question and say, can we understand nature? And this is not a trivial question. It is a question that has bothered philosophers for a very long time. Starting with the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who said, nature loves to hide. And we must think about it. Nature loves to hide. So do not think that you open your eyes, you look at something and you have understood why nature is what it is. So this statement we keep always in the back of our mind. And this statement gives us caution in our research. But then there is another philosopher, Sir Francis Bacon, who gave us some hope. He said, yes, nature loves to hide, but nature might unveil its secrets if you do some experiments. And this gives us hope. And using this caution as our bedrock and hope as our springboard, we have been working for 40 years trying to understand why these wasps behave the way they do. Now I move on to finding and applying appropriate research methodologies. Now, in order to do whatever we are doing, there are many different ways of doing it. There are many different methods, many different technologies we can use. And I'm sure all of, in all your fields, you will have similar options. Which one do you use? First, or not first, there, is, there are three pillars here. One is you ask a question. Your research involves a question which you want to answer. And you use, in my case, an organism or a system or a chemical or a metal or whatever, some object that you use to answer that question. And then there is a method by which you answer that question. And now the question that we should ask is, of these three things, is there a hierarchy? Should there be a hierarchy? Should I first choose the question? and then the method and then the organism, or first the organism, then the question, then the method. There are many ways of doing this. Is there a better way than the others? Of all the possible ways of doing it, is there a better way? Is there a best way? We must ask ourselves these questions before we do our research. And this is very interesting because people don't ask themselves this question, but many people have well-formed opinions about it. Even without thinking about it, they have a clear opinion. And here I want to say, I want to give you a little anecdote. Every year at the Center for Ecological Science and Indian Science, we interview students when they come for their PhD program. And we interview each student for about 30 minutes. We interview about 100 students over a week period. And for every student, I make it a point to ask the following question. If you are given a free choice and all the facilities you need, what is it that you would like to research on? This is a question I ask every student. Most students are not sure, but because we are in the center for ecological sciences, we get some students are very sure what they want to do. Because they have been interested in nature from the beginning and they often tell you what organism, what animal they want to work on. I want to work on the tiger. I want to work on the snake. I want to work on this bird. So they are very sure of the organism. So I want to recount one particular anecdote. There was a student who in response to my question, well, he said, some years ago an unusually determined student gave me a firm answer. He wished to work on lesser cats asking whatever questions he might be able to ask using whatever method that are available. Lesser cats are very difficult to see. I tried to argue with him, reminding him that lesser cats were extremely hard to study, 
They were nocturnal, shy and difficult to locate, let alone observe and obtain quantitative data. Why not work on some easier animal which you could ask more sophisticated questions, I asked him. No, he was adamant, lesser cats it would be if he had any choice in the matter. So some people have very clear opinions. I myself have thought about this question a great deal and I believe that there should be a hierarchy in this and my own personal preference is the following. His determination has stayed in my memory ever since. Other students have given different answers. Some students give primacy to the research field or the question and so on. And as a result of much brooding, in, uh, spurred by the response of students many years, I have come to the following conclusion. For me, the question comes first. I would first like to decide what question I want to ask. Then I would find an organism that is suitable for answering that question and not the other way around. And finally, the method for me would be the slave and not the master. I would not say, I have this instrument, let me do whatever I can do with this instrument. For me, that's not true. It could be for you. Whatever be your hierarchy, don't use it unthinkingly, is all I'm saying. Think about it. If you say, for me, the method comes first, then the object, and then the question, fine. But justify it to yourself. What is the logic that makes you do that? Even if finally I have to say, I have no logic, I had no choice, this is the only instrument I had and therefore that's the only thing I could do, no problem. But say that, state it to yourself explicitly. Let it not be in the back of your mind, which some uh, psychiatrist has to pull it out later on. Be explicit to yourself. You say, yes, next three years I have this constraint, this is all I can do and that's why I'm going to do it. But do not confuse that this is the only way to do it or this is the best way to do it. You may not be able to do the best thing, but you should know what is the best thing. And you should know why you are doing the second best or the third best thing for this constraint. So that when those constraints disappear, then you can go back and do the first best thing. If you don't do that, then you be begin to believe that this is the best thing to do. And even when the constraints disappear, you will continue to do the same thing. Okay, that's my logic. Now, I want to make a few more specialized comments, especially in relation to biology, but again I believe that you can try and apply this to yourself. One of my heroes in ecology, not so much in evolution, but kind of evolution, but ecology, is a man called Robert MacArthur. Robert MacArthur is considered the father of quantitative ecology. Before him, people, ecology was a very descriptive subject. He made it really quantitative and mathematical. And he's one of my heroes for many reasons, also very for very human, emotional reasons. He was brilliant, he did some extremely important work, he gave birth to this new field of mathematical quantitative ecology, and yet he died of cancer very early in life. And once he was diagnosed with cancer, he was in hospital, and he wrote a book completely from memory from his deathbed essentially. This is a human element, it moves me and I, I admire him even more for that. The entire book is written from memory and he says, therefore some references may be wrong, please pardon me. And it's a brilliant book. And there are many, many gems of insights into that book. And I want to quote one small passage from that book. This book is called Geographical Ecology, Patterns in the Distribution of Species. And I want to quote a few lines from this book, which have impressed me a great deal in this whole effort of trying to understand how and why we do research. How and why we do the kind, the specific research that we actually do, not research in a general way. So let me quote Robert MacArthur. He says, to do science is to search for repeated patterns, not simply to accumulate facts. And to do the science of geographical ecology, now he's going, going from the general to the specific, to do the science of geographical ecology is to search for patterns of plant and animal life that can be put on a map. That is geographical ecology. The person best equipped to do this is the naturalist, who loves to note changes in bird life up a mountainside, or changes in plant life from mainland to island, or changes in butterflies from temperate to the tropics. This is the best person, best qualified to do this. However, not all naturalists want to do science. Many take refuge in nature's complexity as a justification to oppose any search for patterns. There are many old-fashioned people who say you cannot have a general pattern. Nature is so complex, so rich, so great that you cannot find patterns. And he says this is what is inimical to do science. 
and he goes on to say doing science is not such a barrier to feeling or such a dehumanizing influence as is often made out it does not take away the beauty from nature the only rules of scientific method are honest observation and accurate logic to be great science it must also be guided by a judgment almost an instinct of what is worth studying no one should feel that honesty and accuracy guided by imagination have any power to take away nature's beauty science should be general in its principles a well known ecologist remarked that any pattern visible in my birds but not in your paramecium should not be interesting this is one now i'll give you a converse thing and now i'll quote aristotle who made a very interesting point and this particularly applies to biologists aristotle said it is the mark of an instructed mind to rest satisfied with the degree of precision which the nature of the object permits and not to seek an exactness where only an approximation of the truth is possible now either you have qualitative biologists who are against quantifying or you have quantitative biologists who want to get the 10th decimal place of everything when it is not possible this is very evident in ecology so to fight against this there are many examples in fact there's one wonderful book which i always take to my class and show my students and say so this is the only book where even reading the cover is instructive you don't have to read the rest of the book guess what the cover of the book says the cover of the book says consider a spherical cow there are many problems that you can solve many questions you can answer simply by approximating the cow as a sphere you don't have to account for its four legs and its tail or its ears many problems can be solved just by doing that so approximation is also extremely important and that again either i said people swing from one extreme to the other either i will not quantify or i will not approximate i want to go to the last i want to look at every molecule in the system so this balance one has to achieve and that comes from experience but experience is not enough experience constantly with thinking and self reflection and that is what we don't do enough we do not permit time for ourselves to self reflect to think we are running we are busy we are doing things we are not reflecting but if you provide adequate time for self reflection then only experience will turn into wisdom if you are running you are not going to see anything but if you are walking and looking at the sides you accumulate great deal of information as you go along i want to end by talking about publishing i know this is a important topic a controversial topic not everybody agrees i'll give you my views my views are that we have an unfortunate fashion parade of journals and i think this is a shame that we judge papers by which journal they are published there is a fashion parade in all my life again i'll tell you my personal views in all my life i have never ever found it necessary to pay attention to the impact factor of any journal i do not pay attention to the impact factor of journals when i not when i read not when i publish and not when i judge unfortunately this is not what everybody does and the reason why i do this is because i believe that how do i choose a journal when i want to publish there is on the y axis here there is popularity quality impact factor on the x axis there is disciplinary appropriateness and people say you should consider both these and then choose where your paper fits i disagree what i think we should do is to collapse the y axis there is no y axis this disciplinary appropriateness is really the only thing that i use to choose both to publish to read and to evaluate there are many reasons for doing this i won't i don't have the time to do this but i have written extensively about my views on this judging and evaluating the work of colleagues peers and students this is something that all of us all scientists have to do and we have to do it all the time believe me we spend more time doing this than actually doing our science the older you go the ratio of doing science and judging in fact sometimes i feel paranoid i feel i am always judgmental i am not able to read anything with judging because i have so much work to do in terms of referring papers referring grant proposals evaluating answer scripts evaluating institutions i don't have time to read something without being judgmental so most of the time we are going to be judgmental but this is a topic on which we don't think about 
I cannot tell you how I judge because that's very difficult to describe. But I can tell you how I don't judge. I don't judge people by the number of papers they have published, by the journals in which the work is published, the cost and sophistication of the research, or the practical utility of the research. That's not how I judge the quality of the research. Because you can have good science, you can have bad science, you can have basic science, you can have applied science. For me, good science is what matters. Whether it is basic or applied is irrelevant. You can have good basic research, bad basic research. You can have good applied research, you can have bad applied research. And about impact factors, a great deal has been written and I encourage students to read about the difficulties of using impact factors. How I do judge, again, I cannot give you a precise answer. I can give you a very human answer. For me, the acid test for identifying a good piece of research is that I should feel a tinge of jealousy for not having done that work myself. You might say, but you can only do this in your own field. I said, yes, I should make judgments only in my own field. I should not sit as president of Indian National Science Academy and decide which physicist should be elected to the academy. I should leave it to the physicists. Each of us should judge in our domain and you should feel a tinge of jealousy. And there is a lot hidden in this statement. Imagine that somebody has done a fantastic piece of work. Why do I not feel jealous? Because I simply don't have that equipment. No question of my feeling jealous. But if I had that equipment and I didn't do it, or if it didn't require any equipment, you should feel jealous. Every time you go to the library, you should feel jealous. Read only those papers that make you feel jealous. That will motivate you to do something. I don't have too much time, but I just want to quickly talk about a few other things. I just mentioned them. Science is going too fast, and I think it's important to be slow. So there is a very nice book called The Slow Professor, which I encourage non-professors to read, especially non-professors. And in the book it says, we are slow professors. We believe that adopting the principles of slow in our professional practice is an effective way to alleviate work stress, preserve humanistic education and resist the corporate university. Slow professor, uh, professors advocate deliberation over acceleration. We need time to think and so do our students. Time for reflection and open-ended inquiry is not a luxury, but it is crucial for what we do. I read another interesting article which said the rhetoric of excellence is pervasive across academia. But what does excellence mean? Does it in fact mean anything at all? And is the pervasive narrative of excellence and competition a good thing? We interrogate excellence as a concept and find that it has no intricate meaning as used in the academy. Excellence is not excellent. It is a pernicious and dangerous rhetoric that undermines the very foundations of good research and scholarship. There's a very old book which says, seek happiness in quality, not quantity. There's another interesting article which says, put the PH back in PhD. We need big thinkers, but the current system teaches students to think small. I, and the book says, I refuse to accept that we can't do better than we are doing now in organizing academia and science. In the Indian situation, fortunately, actually, we are still a bit primitive. Our universities are not yet so corporate, simply because we are backwards. Most of them do not serve on student fees, nor on overheads from extramural grants. There are no different competitive salaries, it's against the law. Faculty time is not budgeted hour to hour as in many Western universities. Universities are not funded based on excellence yet. It will happen very soon. Just about, just has begun to happen, but not yet very common. But our primitiveness is fragile. So this primitiveness is what is saving us so far, but that primitiveness is fragile, waiting to be eroded by the misguided engines of progress and modernity. We need to guard against this. In conclusion, I want to reiterate, there are many ways and many reasons for doing science. It's not very important how and why you do research, but it's very important to constantly think about and write about how and why you do research. I have written many, many articles about how and why I do research and about these kinds of things. And I think every one of us should do that. Sometimes writing for the public brings out an honesty that you may not have when you just think in private. 
I want to end with what I call a lament for the road. We don't do nearly enough to protest what we don't like. Whenever I give lectures, people give me hundred excuses saying, we can't do this because of that, we can't do this because of that. Many, many excuses for not doing what we think is right. Most of the time it is probably correct. And yet I think we do not do enough to protest. We do not even do a little bit different from what we are forced to do. So I was trying to explain this to my student one day and I said, I am standing here and I would like to be there. But the society wants me to be there and therefore I can't go there. And I was telling the student, yes you can't go there, you will probably die if you go there. But why can't I move one step and see what happens? Maybe nothing happens. Just move one step in the direction that I like. He said, Professor, your explanation is too complicated. I will give you a little image which you can explain this concept much better. And he gave me this image. Here is a horse, a well-bred horse tied to a plastic chair and it thinks it cannot move anymore. And that's the kind of situation we are tying ourselves into. And that's why I'm happy to address young people and say, do not be like this horse. Move and see what happens. The chair will come flying with you. Thank you very much. What about the established institutions, groups, who have all the prizes and everything, and somebody joins them? Do you think he has an intention to even think independently of his senior to the group? In many cases, the answer is no. But what I am saying is, I, I said this once, but I'll say it again. Even if you are temporarily doing something which is not your first choice, which is because of some constraint or the other, think about it. Think about why I am doing this and what I would do if this constraint were removed. If you constantly think about this, only then, when you are in a better situation, you would do. Otherwise, the problem with all of us is human psychology. We get used to it. You know, we get bad food in the mess every day. Say, this is how food is. And you get used to this. And then you go home and cook bad food. So constantly remind yourself why you are doing what you are doing. It may be because of complete free will and complete logic that you have decided. It may be because of constraints. It may be because of anything. But constantly tell yourself why you are doing this. So that when the situations change, you will be able to change. Don't get used to what you are doing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Sorry, say that again. Do I? Quota permit Quota permit Raj. Research institute, like a supervisor can't have more than three students. A supervisor can't take. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see the spirit of what you are saying. Unfortunately, we cannot and should not make a general rule for the whole country. It depends very much on the individual situation. Instead of measuring the number of students, what I would say is measure the amount of mentoring an individual is give, able to give to a student. I know some people who have no time to mentor even one student. I know people who have time to mentor five students. It depends on the individual. So we cannot and should not make general rules. But again, it's, you know, see, life is always complicated. What does mentoring mean? Are you going to measure how many hours I spend with my student? I know some colleagues who spend so much time with their students that the students have no freedom whatsoever. They are used like slaves. That's not good. So again, it is not by the hours. It's the way you mentor students. It's the way you make them think. And it, this is a very fine balance. In fact, sometimes my students think, he's not even telling me what to do. In fact, I'll tell you an example. In a class, I asked a question. I, I told about a certain theory. And one very smart student said, Sir, but I have read somewhere that that theory is wrong. What is your opinion? I said, I certainly will not give you my opinion. Go and find out the facts and make your opinion. Tell me your opinion and I'll tell you my opinion simultaneously. If I tell you my opinion, you will never find your opinion. Now there are some students who think this professor doesn't even answer questions. 
No, I will refuse to answer such a question. I don't want to tell you my opinion. When it comes to opinion, I won't tell you my opinion. You give and take, you tell me your opinion, I'll tell you simultaneously. If I tell you my opinion before that you form your opinion, you will never form your opinion. Unfortunately, that's a power structure. At least I'm older than you. So, mentoring is a very complex business. How much facts you give, how much you don't give, how much freedom you give, how much you don't give, it's a very complex thing. And so it's very difficult to judge by simple things like number of students, let alone generalize for a whole larger situation. But if we want to improve the mentor-student relationship, now some these youngsters will not like me for saying this, but I tell you, the change will come from the young, from the students, not from the mentors. You have to demand and make it possible. Why? Because why you don't do it? Because you are tied to a plastic chair. If you realize that you're only tied to a plastic chair, you will bring about things. Only you can bring about this change. Yes, somebody. Uh, yes, sir. You talked about hierarchy in and Many animals live a predominantly solitary life, so the question doesn't arise there. They don't interact much at all with each other. So there the question doesn't arise. But when live animals live in groups, they have to interact with each other. There, by and large, there is a hierarchy, but the hierarchy can be very complicated. There may be one hierarchy for access to food. There may be another hierarchy for access to reproduction. There may be a third hierarchy for access to work. So it is organized hierarchically, but it's not a unique hierarchy. And again, unfortunately in biology, as they say, the devil is in the details. You have to study each species. It varies. For example, most of the species of the, I study one species, most of the species of that kind which has been studied suggested that aggression, physical aggression is the basis of social life. I started studying a species in detail and I found that's not true at all. Aggression is not the basis. So every species may be different. So we have to study in great detail. In biology, the devil is indeed in the details. Yes, sir. Uh, one of your slides is on the, uh, the order of the, that you first say the person. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. No, the division between organism and subordinate is not a method decision. It's not a method. The method comes later. It is the domain that you want to study. It's not a method. Ah, huh, but that's not just method. I have we have many students and no instrument. That's not method. Method is specific. Whether see, for I'll give you an example. When a method, so in ecology, it means: Are you going to use DNA sequencing? Are you going to count the number of birds in the forest or are you going to look at the amount of precipitation or are you going to build a mathematical model? Those are the methodology questions. Those are the methods that you have to make up. So, for example, I, as I said, there is a, there's somebody who says, I am interested in microscopy. So, I will do whatever is possible with microscopy or I don't like to be in the lab, I like to be outdoors. So, whatever can be done outdoors, I will do. That kind, again I'm not saying everybody should be like that. I, I believe that the question is paramount. Next comes the organism and next comes. So with all the hierarchy I came, what did I come to? Finally, from organismal biology to evolution to same species interaction to altruism. Once I came to altruism, I said now I want to study altruism. What is the best species to study altruism? Most of the world uses honeybee to study altruism. And I said that is not the best of species. Because honeybees became altruism 60 million years ago. How will I know what was the circumstance at that time they actually transitioned from selfish to altruism? Not possible. Here is a species which is present all over South India where they are trying today. Today some, of, some are selfish, some are altruistic. In one individual's life, sometimes it is selfish, sometimes it is altruistic. So if I want to study the transition from selfish to altruist, there is no better species than this. So altruism became my question, Ropalidia marginata became my species, and then observation became my methodology. Not extracting DNA, not doing physiology, but observation and mathematical modeling became my method. For me, that was altruism. 
But again, I want to emphasize, you can use any hierarchy of this. All I'm saying is justify it to yourself again and again, from time to time. Convince yourself, why am I doing this? What we lack is reflection. And one of the reasons why I'm advocating the slow professor is have time to think, have time to reflect. Don't spend all your time running and doing things. Do less, but do better things. <laughs> uh, well, uh, this was the, my la this was my last sentence in yesterday afternoon's lecture. Uh, it may sound very funny to say it now, but assuming that you were there in my yesterday's lecture, the answer is yes. But you know, it sounds very funny just to say yes. But I showed a hundred slides at the beginning yesterday to say finally how we actually have been able to m move on the scale of selfishness to cooperation in this particular way. It took us 40 years of research to do that. And even now we just think we are able to do. That is the experiment that is currently actually going on in my, in my lab. <laughs> that doesn't mean we can do it for humans. Yes, sir. I am not aware of this and I have not read. But I would have been very happy if somebody in India had done this because we are the masters of spirituality. <laughs> I wish we had done it. Mm, I, I hope some Indians do that. Yeah, but thank you, I was not aware of this. But I do want to say that there are so many young students sitting here. Please say something. Even disagree with me, doesn't matter, but say something. Yes. Yes. Correct. Correct. No. Ah, each one should decide for yourself. Why do you say, I like to see Amitabh Bachchan's movies and not Shah Rukh Khan's movies, and she says, I want to see Shah Rukh Khan's movies. There is no universal correctness, but you must try and convince yourself why you prefer Amitabh Bachchan and you must convince yourself why you prefer Shah Rukh Khan. Each of us can do different things. There is no universal way, but the problem is we are doing blindly. That is what I am objecting to. Don't do things blindly. Even if you make a mistake, make it consciously. Say, I am making this mistake for this reason. I am stealing a little bit of money because I am hungry. But say it. Otherwise, stealing money becomes a habit. If you say, I am only going to steal a little bit of money today because I am very hungry, then tomorrow when you are not hungry, you will not steal money. But if you steal money blindly, you will continue to steal money for the rest of your life even when you are not hungry. Therefore, all I am saying is, reflect, think consciously about what you are doing. Even if it is wrong, doesn't matter. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes. That 
see there are many ways people are trying to get at this one is by looking at philosophy another is by looking at psychology but there is a very interesting approach which i like most and that is the approach of game theory and mathematics so using game theory and mathematics people are trying to predictions of how humans might behave in such situations now i like that because i like game theory and mathematics but i also like that because in that approach people are able to make direct experimentally testable predictions which are very hard to come by in a philosophical approach or even a psychological approach you know even the great sigmund freud he may said many, many many things but you can never verify he is right or wrong but when you make a game theory prediction you can actually perform an experiment in fact there are experiments you can perform with humans i have done this as part of my teaching in a class of students we can make them play a game and from that we can explain human behavior so economists psychologists and bi- evolutionary biologists have got together and created this new field of games so they've invented games and they play these games with different kinds of people in different circumstances and the outcome of the game is used to explain human behavior that is only one approach but for me that's my favorite approach yes Yes. Yes. No, no, no. All I'm saying is, choose whatever you want, but explicitly justify it to yourself. You can say, this is easier to do in India, this is hard to do in India, but I love this so much that I'm going to do this. Fine, but say it to yourself. Justify it to yourself. I'm not telling you which to choose, but I'm saying don't do things blindly. Be conscious of the fact that... that you are doing working under sub optimal conditions because of your inordinate love for something but be conscious of that because tomorrow when the conditions change you can change your behavior my problem is if you do things blindly you believe that that's the only way to do things that this is the only subject to study that is all i am saying i am not saying you should do what i did i told you why i am do- i i am doing what i am doing and i want you to tell yourself why you are doing what you are doing as long as that is there then you are flexible you can change in the future that's all i'm saying i'm not saying everybody should do organizational biology or everybody even should do what is easy to do no not at all i am choosing this because it's easy to do somebody may say i am choosing it because difficult to do fine but say it. don't do it blindly and in order to do that we must create a situation where we have time to think we don't have time to think we are so busy and i think we are doing too much bad science we must do a little less but good science and spend the same time in thinking about how we do why we do we don't think about it we don't discuss it we don't talk about it we don't teach about it we don't have seminars about it i i will give a whole talk about it because i think this is what we should be doing you should have more such interaction even amongst yourselves spend time thinking about it.